Okay, um, this is Mike Zellers, and I am uh, the instructor for CISS environment. And today we're going to have a big introduction to the course and, and right away sort of getting into the material for the course. Uh, I don't review the syllabus typically in this class or Canvas. Um, I assume you've all have been through Canvas before and that you can uh, go and review that on your, on your own time. This is a blended course. Uh, there might be a little confusing because there's actually two sections, an online section and a, uh, a blended section, but regardless of the section that you enter into, that you enrolled in, you're part of the blended class. And here's what that means, All right, in a nutshell. I want to go over this and make sure you understand it because my aim is to make this as flexible as possible for, for you. All right. And what that means is once a week, there's an in person lecture. All right. And that in person lecture is on Tuesdays at, at 9 a.m. in BU 103. All right. The rest of the time of the week, what would what would ordinarily take the place of uh, would what ordinarily would be a, another lecture. You know, typically classes meet two days a week, but instead there'll be online materials uh, for you to review uh, to make up the rest of the instruction for the week. So one lecture a week on Tuesdays, 9 a.m. in BU 103. Now. You can view this lecture one of three ways. And we probably have students doing all three of them today. All right. And you don't have to choose and say, I'm going to, I'm going to be in person or I'm going to be uh, synchronously uh, distance learning or asynchronously. You can mix and match. So uh, the three options are that you can show up in person and view the class in person, like a traditional class. So you can view the in-person lecture on Tuesdays at 9 a.m. in person. Show up to class, and if you want to, show up in lab, right? Your other option is like one of, one of the students here, you can see, Matthew, uh, is watching this uh, online. Uh, synchronously. By synchronously, we mean he's watching it as it's going on. He's watching it live, which means if he has a question, he can ask the question right away and get an answer. All right. So you can view it in person, synchronously, or you can view it asynchronously. And by asynchronously, all the lectures will be posted. The recordings of the lectures will be posted after the fact. So if you're not able to watch it synchronously or you're not able to watch it in person, you can watch a recording of the lecture. So that's intended to accommodate any of your needs. If you need to take an online class, like if you work during the day and you're not able to attend the lectures, uh, then you can watch the recording of the class. So I aim to, to get the best of, of all worlds here. In, in doing this. And again, you don't have to choose. You can decide from week to week. You can typically show up to class, but if there's one week that you're not feeling well, you can watch it synchronously. Or if you have a doctor's appointment and you have to miss class, you can uh, watch it asynchronously after the fact. So uh, the class is designed with you, uh, with your ultimate flexibility in mind. All right. As far as lab goes, there is an in person lab as well. So immediately after this class, we go up to the lab room, or I go up to the lab room, BU 10, in this case, from 10 until 11, and I have a lab. And if you want, you can show up in person for that to work on your lab assignments. So in person, you can show up. If you do not want to show up in person, but you're still working on your assignments and you have questions, you can come to my WebEx room same place where you view the lectures, and I'll be live uh, from the lab to answer any of your questions in real time. Now, 
I have it set up so you can come not just during your lab time, but during my other classes lab times as well. So I have a list of office hours where I'm available and uh, take a look at those. Um, and you can either come to the lab physically or you can uh, go into WebEx and um, meet with me uh, online if you have any questions. If you if the, if the lab times or the office hour times don't work for you, uh, feel free. We can schedule some other time to me. So I, I want there to be no obstacles for you getting the assistance that you need. Uh, I meet with students frequently, uh, not during regular class time or office hours. And one thing that COVID taught us is the ability to use some of these tools like WebEx so that we don't have to be in the same physical place at the same time and you can get your questions answered. So uh, key to this class, key to all the classes that I teach is you getting the help that you need, right? So if you're understanding something, that's great. But when you start having difficulty with something, please ask the questions, all right? You're not bothering me, you're not upsetting me. Uh, we'll figure it out one way or another. You know, we can converse via email, Sometimes that's all the student needs is maybe just a nudge in the right direction via an email. Sometimes they need to schedule an online session with me. But uh, if you do that, I can almost guarantee that you'll be successful in this class, right? If you take the time to ask questions when you have questions and, and are willing to work with me in doing what you need to to pass this class, I can almost guarantee you'll be successful in this class. All right, the students that typically are not successful in this class are the ones that just sort of disappear. Maybe they're struggling with an assignment or whatever, and they don't reach out for help. They try to struggle through it on their own, and they end up just getting further and further behind. It's admirable that students want to figure out their own problems. It really is, but you're in an educational environment. You're not expected to master everything first try. All right, therefore, if you're trying to do something in an assignment and you don't quite get it, by all means, ask the question. Ask me the question. All right. Um, the rest of the stuff as far as uh, what my exact WebEx room is, uh, the specific office hours, um, other information you can you could review on Canvas. So please review on Canvas the syllabus. And there is a module for every week, uh, along with a module describing how the blended class works and how the lectures work. All right, what I want to do is I want to start covering the material in this class. And the title of this class is scripting in the client server environment. So I'm going to take a minute. sort of draw a diagram and talk about just exactly what that means and, and sort of lay out the direction that this class is going to go in and the, the give an overview of the topics that we're going to talk about in this class. All right. Scripting in the client server uh, development. So far, if you've done uh, web development and taken CISS 216, you have done HTML and you have done CSS. You might have done just a touch of JavaScript uh, at the very end of the course. HTML and CSS are ways of describing documents on the web. HTML relates to the content of the document, and CSS relates to the appearance and the physical layout of the page. Right? When we talk about scripting, we're talking about something beyond the document and the layout. We're talking about actually more nuts and bolts type programming. And there's two kinds of scripting, because typically in any web environment, there's two systems interacting. There's what's called the client and there's what's called the server. The client is the person that is sitting 
at a laptop using a web browser to connect to the internet and to visit sites on the internet. So they're connected to the internet, which will draw like a cloud. And they're asking for web pages and they're getting web pages back. In a little more precise terms, they're making a request and they're getting back a response. And the response they get back contains HTML, CSS, and maybe some JavaScript. It contains some combination of these three. Probably in most modern sites, it will contain some of each of those things. That's the client. That's the person that is using it. All right. Person that is using the web. The entity that is providing the web pages is called the server. And the server takes in requests and responds to those requests. Really good analogy for this is if you think about a restaurant, you know, the client is the customer. The customer makes requests of the server, you know, that they want a burger, that they want a glass of water, that, they, that they're ready for the check uh, or whatever. So the client makes requests and the server responds to those requests. So the server goes, okay, I'll put that order in the kitchen and I'll bring it back to you when uh, it's ready. Or here, here's my water pitcher. You want a refill? Here you go. So on. So the client makes request and the server responds to the request. Now, in the world of CISS 216, all right, we had what are called static web pages. And static web pages, if we say something is static in this way, we mean unchanging. So let's say you had a thumb drive of all the uh, assignments that you did for CISS 216. All right, first assignment all the way through your final pro uh, project. If you were to open those things today, you open those projects today, they would look exactly the same as when you saved them initially. All right. Unless you manually went in and changed those. All right. Unless you manually went in and changed those. So those are static web pages. They're created using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the server has a very easy job when you request a static web page. The server simply finds the files that you need and gives you those files and doesn't do any processing. It's kind of like a server at a McDonald's. You order a filet of fish sandwich, they turn, they look in the little bin for filet of fish sandwiches, they take that sandwich out and, and deliver it to you. You order fries, they grab fries out of the bin and they deliver it to you. Now you can build very simple, but possibly effective websites using static websites. But most of the websites today are what are called dynamic. And what we mean by dynamic is that they, the, the contents of the web page, and maybe even the way the web page looks, depends on some circumstances, all right? For example, Canvas would be an example of a dynamic site. Why do I say that? Well, if, if everyone in the room and everyone that's watching this logged on to Canvas and looked and we compared our Canvas homepages, they would all look different, all right? It's the same website, you know, we're all going to canvas.lorainccc.edu and we're all going to the Canvas homepage, but we log on, we, we supply credentials, and our page depends on the credentials we entered. 
So if I log in, I see all the classes that I teach. And what's more, I have instructor privileges in those classes. So I can grade things. I can add new lessons and, and so on. Whereas you as a student in those classes, you can submit assignments, but you can't grade your own assignments. All right, sometimes it might be easier for both of us if you could. All right, but you can't unfortunately grade your assignments. Um, you can send emails and all that, but you can't really add any content to it other than submitting assignments and sending messages. So a, a dynamic page, the content changes based on something. Static means it's unchanged. Dynamic means it changes based on something. So how do we get a web page that is different for every person that logs on? We do that through the use of what's called server-side scripting. And scripting is programming. It's using languages such as you may have studied in other classes, such as C Sharp or PHP or Python or Ruby or any number of other languages that don't simply retrieve finished web pages, but actually dynamically create web pages on the fly. All right. Let's give a classic example of this and look at Google. And I tend to always give food analogies because I like to eat. Let's say we go to Google and we're going to search for Italian restaurants. All right, let's notice some things. First of all, the top three Italian restaurants are, are real close here, right? There's Sorrento's, which is just up the road. There's the Olive Garden, which is by the, the mall, which is maybe a 10 minute drive. I don't know, maybe less than that. There's Angelina's Pizzas, which I don't know where it is, but it doesn't look too far. It's on, it's on Abbey Road. TripAdvisor gives us the 10 best Italian restaurants in Elyria and the 10 best restaurants in North Ridgeville. So does Grubhub. And so on down the line. Here's one that's in Lakewood, which is not too far away. Cleveland Heights, which isn't that far away, and so on. Now, if you look at this and think about this, you notice something funny is going on, right? can't simply be a web page out there that's already written and provides Italian restaurants and they all coincidentally are within a few miles of where we currently are at, right? Put another way, if someone in New York City ran this, they would get an entirely different list of restaurants someone in San Francisco, someone in Italy, all right? They would all get very different lists of restaurants. <laughs> That's because the search results for Google are not static web pages. They're not web pages that were written and saved and are retrieved and delivered to people, clients, when they ask for the page. Instead with Google, a server executes a program, a script. And that program, again, can be PHP. It could be ASP.NET in C Sharp. It could be some form of Java and so on. But that program executes and produces output in this form. If we look at this web page, we can view source, a little hard to read, but really, it's simply an HTML file with CSS and JavaScript. 
So the difference between static web pages and dynamic web pages uh, is that static pages, the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are predefined. And with dynamic web pages, the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS are created by a program. And our job is not to just write the web pages, but to write the program that writes the web pages. Okay. So that's the server side of things. When we talk about scripting in the client server environment. There's scripting that exists on the server side that is used to create content for dynamic websites. And again, if you were to list the most popular websites, all right, they would very nearly all be dynamic websites, all right? Canvas, you know, dynamic. Page looks different depending on who logs on. Google, the page is dynamic depending on where you're at in the world. It might depend on if you're logged on. If you're logged on and you search for things in a certain topic, you're going to get more results about that topic. Um, Facebook is dynamic. Your timeline on Facebook is going to look different than mine because of you have your friends, I have mine. All right, eBay eBay is constantly being updated with bids. So if you looked at an item now and came back a half hour later, the item might look different because someone placed a higher bid and so on. All these things are dynamic, which means the pages change or the content changes on the pages without someone going in and changing the page itself. All right, either a database is updated or something like that occurs and program when it retrieves the new data gives you an updated page. So server-side scripting is used to create web pages. That's the role of server-side scripting is to create web pages, right? And create them dynamically based on any number of factors, who logged on, what you entered in the search for Google, all these things. Now, both the client and the server are devices which have computing power associated with them. So the client could be someone sitting at a desktop machine or a laptop, or it could be someone using a phone or even a gaming console, all right? And they're making requests through the internet and the server is responding to those requests and giving it to the client. But the client has some computing power too. And client server scripting takes advantage of the fact that there is computing power on the client as well. And typically, client side scripting is used to alter web pages that have already been delivered. Specifically alter the appearance of them. Classically how client side scripting is used. And a good example of that is if we visit ESPN's website. We go to ESPN.com. All right, notice these menu items up here on the top. NFL, NBA, NHL, so on. This page has been delivered to me, all right? Me, the client, made the request by typing in the address I wanted. That request went through the internet, made it to ESPN server. The ESPN server did what it needed to do, probably via a dynamic script, all right? Because it pulls up the latest scores, you know? And there's not a programmer out there, you know, changing the HTML to handle the latest scores, but that's being pulled from a database or something. And that gets delivered as an HTML document <laughs> to the client. All right. So right now we're at this point. 
We, the client, are sitting there looking at this web page that has been delivered to us. Now, in this case, the server delivers us more content than we actually see at the moment. What do I mean by that? I mean, if I put my mouse over the NFL, I get a menu. And notice how that happens instantaneously. There's no delay whatsoever. And in fact, if you look at the little status bar, you don't see anything like that the page is loading. So like if I click refresh and, and request the page again from the server, notice you get that message waiting for something, or sometimes it will say loading. What that means is the client has made the request and the server's doing its thing processing it and giving the response and the client's waiting for the response to come back. But we don't get that when we put our mouse over here. It's not going through the internet and asking a server for anything. That content has already been delivered to the client. And all we're doing is based on where the mouse is positioned, we're showing and hiding that content. Why do we do this on the client side versus the server side? Number one, if we do it on the client side, we're allowed, we're able to give an immediate response. All right. That happens instantaneously. There's not a little delay while it's going through the internet. And if you have a bad connection, you know, it might take 15, 30 seconds or something like that. It happens instantaneously. Secondly, we're not bothering the server for something small, all right? Just displaying a new menu is not really a, a very uh, extensive uh, processing, uh, piece of processing. And therefore, we're not bothering the server to do that. The server is meant to do heavy lifting, like database interaction and so on. The client can handle some of these small things. So the, the client has all the code it needs and it simply shows and hides different menus depending on where your mouse is positioned. So we're gonna spend a good part of the semester on client-side scripting, which is JavaScript, server-side scripting, which is, we're gonna use PHP, and the third thing that we're going to cover is Ajax. And Ajax is sort of where you have the client and the server interacting in a special way. And you can see that right here. As I type in something, it narrows down the search results. So I type in an H, it gives me a list of popular things that start with H. I type in HT, it gives me a list of things that start with HT. M, it gives me things that start with HTM, so on. That's Ajax, because the server is providing the data and the client side scripting is formatting that data and changing the page without refreshing the entire page. Normally, when we go to the server, we're getting back a complete web page. Ajax allows us to just get a piece of data, small piece of data, and update the page. So those are the main topics we're going to have this semester and sort of how they work together. I know in CISS 216, you did some basics with JavaScript. We're going to review an example. We might have had one like it before or we might not have, but we're going to review this example. All right, in this case, I have and this is getting to this is what we're going to do is we're going to sort of deconstruct
how this works. Put your mouse over it, a menu appears. Here, put our mouse over it, and boom, there's a submenu. Now, it's not a complete submenu, but it is uh, part of the submenu. So let's look at the code here. And in this example, we're going to see how the client and the server all work together. And what did I do here? Oh. We have our web page. Basic stuff. We have our style that makes this div our submenu invisible. We then have this link. And with that link, we have a piece of JavaScript code that's going to display that submenu when the user puts their mouse over it. So, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript all work together. The HTML contains all the code both the main menu and the submenu. CSS initially hides the submenu. And the JavaScript makes the submenu visible when the user puts their mouse over it. All those three pieces together work to get the desired effect that we have. And again, you know, right now it just says, here's my submenu, but really, we could have a full set of links. We have our menu item here. All right. Let's look at the JavaScript. Most of the JavaScript that we're going to encounter starts off or gets triggered by a user event. A user event simply means when the user does something, I want the JavaScript to respond in a certain way. In this case, we have the on mouse over event. And we can say for that link, when the user puts the mouse over that link to do this. Between the double quotes, is our JavaScript instruction. Document, get element by ID, submenu, style, display, equals block. All right? After an event, when we say the event equals, we have a JavaScript statement. That JavaScript statement is going to have a couple things for it. One of the things it's going to do is going to use what's called the DOM. The DOM stands for the Document Object Model. 
And it's the way that we refer to things on a web page. Because we're going to change things on the web page. We're going to make this visible when it used to be invisible. So we need a way to point to the different things on the web page. And that method is called the DOM. So let's break this down because what we're doing is we're zeroing in on the thing that we want to change. Each step narrows it a little bit further. Document. That means the thing that we want to change is on the web page somewhere. Right? Which a lot of the times is going to be on the web page somewhere. <laughs> there are exceptions to that, but when we say document dot something, it means it's on the web page somewhere. Yeah, element by ID means the thing that we're interested in has an ID of this submenu. And what has an ID of submenu? This div does. So the thing that we're interested in changing is this div as an ID of submenu. What is it that we want to change? We want to change something about the style of it. And what about the style? We want to change the display property. And we want to change it to what? We want to change it to block. Block means it will display as a block tag. So it'll display on a new line. Notice that the JavaScript statement is enclosed within double quotes. If we do that, then anytime we want to use quotes inside the double quotes, we have to use the single quotes. So Things that are instructions, we don't have in quotes, but things that are particular data items, like submenu and block, we put in the single quotes. So in this case, document, get element by ID, submenu, style, display block, find the thing on the page that has an ID of submenu, change its style, Change the display property of the style, which used to be none. Change it to block. So what it will do is it will take this, find it, and it will change the display to block, which means we'll be able to see it. Your mouse over it, boom, you can see it. Now, what if we want to make it disappear? Because that was the other thing that ESPN did. Okay. Displayed it. If we put our mouse out of it, it disappeared. Well, the event for that is on mouse out. So I can say on mouse over. Do this on mouse out. We can set the display back to none. Over, mouse out, over, out. There's a problem. How do we click on one of those links? Yeah, because the minute we move it, it disappears. Well, a few ways that we could do this. Could put this also on the div. Right? 
I don't think that's going to work by itself. Why? Because there's actually a little gap between the two of them. Let's put a border around each of them and we can see it. All of a sudden it works. It's interesting. The reason it works is that border. Do this. Let's not put a border because the border gives it a little bit of uh, fills the gap between the two. is a better way to show it. Notice how there's a gap there between there. And as we put our mouse in the gap, it's no longer over that. So what we have to do is we have to get rid of the margin. And Give everyone no margin. Here we go. Now we can get to it. Okay. The one thing about JavaScript that is, uh, a little annoying is it's case sensitive and it's very picky. Uh, HTML sort of is very forgiving. So if you type in a tag with one capital letter, it doesn't matter. It'll figure it out. But with JavaScript, if you type in this with an ID, a capital D instead of a lowercase d, It's not able to figure it out. What you need to do to figure it out, because you can stare at the code and hope that you see something. But the best way to do this is to look at what the error council says. Now in Google Chrome, if you go to more tools, 
Developers Tools Council, it'll tell you document to get element by ID with an uppercase D is not a function. So it doesn't tell you, hey, you, it should be lowercase d, but it does give you probably enough information to figure it out. All right, that's all I want to go over today. Uh, does anyone either here or uh, watching uh, this live have any questions? Okay, next week we will pick up with more JavaScript. Now, if you look at Canvas, there are some JavaScript tutorials for you to view. Uh, spend time uh, doing that. Uh, your first assignment doesn't require you to use any JavaScript. Uh, it's simply to do some investigation into the main topic areas of this course and create a web page that contains information about all of them. So, uh, I did post, I think, a couple of weeks in advance if you want to work ahead. Maybe not in this class. I did that in some of my classes. I don't recall if I did that in this class or not. All right. At any rate, um, that's all I had for today. Uh, we'll see you up in lab. If you want to connect with me, you can connect via the WebEx room uh, for lab. If not, we'll see you next week.